Pho, the Vietnamese restaurant group with locations all over the UK, really do have something for everyone. Their main menu is 40% vegan. 40%! And ranges from delicious noodle soups to decadent Vietnamese curries. <laughs> Rashim Sachdeva is a returning guest from the Vegans Living Life on the Veg episode. He worked firstly under Marco Pierre White, there's an image, at the Oak Room where he learned classic French cooking before moving on to work at Heston's iconic The Fat Shamed Duck. I kind of slightly <laughs> veganized that. Rishim pledged to Veganuary in 2019 and continued a plant-based diet long past the initial month. His restaurant, Tendril, has a pop-up residency at the Artillery Arms just off Old Street in London. Lauren Lovett, also returning from the Fermentation for Vegan Foodies episode, is a plant-based chef, author of Mind Food, and she's an entrepreneur, founder of Plant Academy, a plant-based culinary academy. Filming and cooking from her food studio in East London, Lauren also works with brands to inspire passion through plants, most notably creating the food concept for Hoy Paris! Mm. Paris's first Newcastle plant-based hotel. I know that's wrong. I'm sorry. I can't believe there's like that going on in Paris. Oh, it's all going on in Paris now. Is that right, Lauren? <laughs> all going on in Paris. I went to a, an all vegan supermarket in Paris years ago. Wow. There's a lot of vegan stuff going on in Paris. It's yeah. becoming more and more vegan by the minute. Amazing. It needs to spread further south into France then because mm. there's, a, I really struggle. My family live in the south of France and nada. <laughs> Yeah. It's yeah, it, or, it, it, yeah it's really, they really difficult. Say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it is difficult. Very difficult. Uh finally, who's uh, you've just heard a voice. Jackie Kearney has published four vegan cookbooks. Vegan Street Food won Peter's Best Vegan that's like Petta Peter, not like some guy. <laughs> uh Best Vegan Cook works better on the script to be honest. Best Vegan Cookbook in 2016 and My Vegan Travels was nominated for an Edward Stanford Travel Writing Award in 2018. Her new book, Healthy Vegan Street Food, is due for release later this year. She was a finalist in BBC One's MasterChef 2011 and the British Street Food Awards in 2012. After seven years serving up Asian fusion street food, Jackie now divides her time between Manchester and Italy. There's a culture shock, where she's building a wellness <laughs> retreat in the Ligurian Mountains. Nice. Welcome, wow. all of you. Thank you. Wow. Um, so all back to yours, I think, Jackie, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if well, we're I want to, to go and eat at Risham's. I'm like, I can't <laughs> wait till my next London visit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, to, I, I can't wait to go to Newcastle. And... I mean, Paris. <laughs> um, it is just pronounced. It's not H O Y. Is it Hoy? You say Hoy, right? Yeah, it's Hoy. Hoy. Yeah. Hoy. May I ask why? <laughs> <laughs> um, it means like hello, like today in Paris in um, Spanish, and then. Oh. Yeah. See, I never, I never picked up Spanish. Yeah, so the the owner is kind of um, Mexican, Parisian, like this amazing entrepreneur. So it's all kind of on uh, her um, experiences. So yeah, it's got a bit of a Spanish Mexican flair as well as the kind of Parisian. Um, chic. No, no Newcastle chic. Not so much. No, I'm that's sorry. <laughs> there you go. You live and learn. Right, we've got lots of questions uh, about British food, although um, there's some sort of fairly. Uh, Typical for Britain, uh, cultural appropriation coming on in some of the questions. <laughs> but let's open with Macy's question. How can I veganise toad in the hole? Well, you can start with the name. Uh, <laughs> I've used chickpea flour in the past, but I struggle with the rise. Ah, Anyone on the panel got tips of how to make a good vegan batter? I mean, this is one of the holy grail questions. We've yeah. talked about Yorkshire puddings. There are a few people doing it. There's, there's someone, I'm going to see if I can dig them out on Instagram, who somewhat hotly indignant messaged me after I said on one of these episodes, you cannot do a vegan Yorkshire pudding. And said, here they are. You can buy them in shops. Look, I make them. And I feel <laughs> terrible. But um, who's got some suggestions on a rise? Uh, Lauren, why don't we start with you? So, I mean, I would say that chickpea flour is amazing for a batter. If it's fermented, it will obviously be great, but you do need a little bit more structure to make a good Yorkshire pudding. And the master of this is actually someone called Kirk Howarth, who is a creator of plates. And he makes, being a kind of um, northerner, he really has um, yeah, perfected his Yorkshire puddings. So it might be worth 
looking at what he's up to but i would say it's all about um structure in the flour and if you're using gluten that helps but you can do them gluten free um not something i've done loads of because i'm obsessed with kirk's and how he does them <laughs> right but um yeah i think anyone else has any particular tips that is a top tip jackie do you do i mean i'm guessing I, if you're doing I healthy do. food you know I, well Carbs I mean, now, and oil is not yeah, necessarily... No, it's not something I'd eat now, but yeah. possibly... Um, I've actually got a recipe in one of my um, previous cookbooks um, mm-hmm. and it's it's actually for a vegan toad in the hole. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> and um, so my tips for getting the rice are to use, obviously, a self-raising flour... Um, and then to use a couple of teaspoons of baking powder with a quarter of a teaspoon of bicarb of soda, a pinch of black salt in there to give that eggy flavor. And then um, when you make the batter, also to uh, make an aquafaba and whip that up into soft peaks. And then as any chef will tell you, any trained chef, vegan or not, will tell you, the other key element is that you need to use a hard fat, like um, the vegan Trex, something like that. And you put the hard fat into your pan in a hot oven. I mean, we're talking like 220, 225 centigrade. Oh, wow. You get it really, you want to get it smoking hot. And then- it's going to say, I've never gone above 200. This is madness. <laughs> so, but you need that heat and that smoking hot fat. And then when you pour the batter in, you drop your you drop your sausages in and straight into the oven. Get that oven door closed as quickly as possible. No opening the oven door, and you should get yeah. a really nice popover style rise on it. Yeah, and it'll have a little eggy flavour as well from the black salt. Nice. Where can I buy an asbestos suit? <laughs> uh, that sounds highly hazardous uh, to me. Uh, Rishim, what about you? What are your to- top tips for a good batter? You know, like Jackie mentioned, the temperature is really important. You know, you want to get your batter at the right temperature when you put that in the oven uh, on a pipe and hot tray. Uh, yeah, so that that's super important. What I would recommend, do not wash those trays, hot or cold. Just wipe them <laughs> off because you don't want that. It's a tough tip. <laughs> The surface to scratch, and the next Yorkshire pudding is stuck to the bottom. That, that, that you do, yeah, it's definitely true, don't want it? that. Yeah, if you even yeah. cough near a non stick pan, it's, that's the end, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a good um, alternative name for Toad in the Hole. I mean, if anyone wants to uh, um, email them in. We, we used to, um, uh, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I did a pop up vegan Christmas feast with a friend of mine, Baker Rama. Uh, that's not her real name, by the way. Okay. <laughs> she makes cakes. No her kidding. name's Charlotte. No one determinism for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Charlotte came up with the name of um, Pigs in Rafts um, because we did these little vegan chipolatas in like tiny little toad in the hole style. Okay. So we, we called them Piggies in Rafts. Um <laughs> Because we felt like we were saving the piggies, you know, from okay. being in it. That was the pun. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Toad in the sanctuary. Uh, <laughs> any other suggestions? <laughs> All welcome. Anyway, it's podcast of veganlifemag.com if you've got an idea. Anna says, I would love to have some leak inspiration, please. That's with a double E before you get excited. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's start with you, um, Jackie. What, what, uh, what do you like to do with a leak? Um, I, I actually, I really, really love leeks. Um, my, one of my favorite things to do with them is braise them. Um, so, and that's so easy because you can just put them in a pan with a good quality veg stock and bra- maybe a little time and, and just braise them in the oven and they go lovely and soft. But if you, if you slice them into one or two inch rounds and braise them like that, you can then use them in like a filling for a savory pancake or for a pissadillière topping, like a, which is like a French, kind of like a pizza, but with a thicker dough base so it can take the, the leeks on it. Nice. Um, so they're absolutely delicious. Um, and you could add a little uh, cumin seeds and mustard seeds and a little curry powder to make a, 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 into a gram flour batter. And then pop the braised leeks into the gram flour batter and make this sort of leek pancake, which is delicious. I've yeah. made that quite a lot. And also, um, that's almost any, like a, a riff on a bargee. I was just thinking, I was just going to say bargies or coftas, 
you know, I think yeah. that they work really super well in that. And of course, um, if you were to use something, are we allowed to mention brand names? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if you were to do something like a vegan corn pie, mm -hmm. so a corn and leek pie, I mean, you know, that those flavours just are like a little marriage there. So they're delicious. Nice. Nice suggestions. Uh, Rishim, what about you? Uh, yeah. So leek, it's such an interesting vegetable. You can do so much with it. Uh, what you can't I'll do is give using it a the grit. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The bag. Uh, wash it thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, so we used to make, we still do, we make this leek oil. So we basically use the green part of the leek that mm. it's very fibrous. It kind of goes in the bin. You know, usually not many people use that until unless it's Lauren who's going to ferment that first. But uh, yeah, we just chop that leek up, blend it with cold oil, bring it to boil and then pass it. So you'll have really, really nice, deep, green, sort of fresh oil and you chill it down. Uh, then we use that oil to confit the leeks. So, oh, you know, the, wow. the, the leeks are Ooh. really kind of the, the flavor is really intensified in that. And we just confit them very, very lightly, like Jackie mentioned, we cut them in rounds and then on a tray, very low heat. Uh, and then if you are feeling a bit more fancy, you can just sort of blow torch or grill the outer, <laughs> the, the thinner layer of the leaf. Uh, then it's a nice smoky sort of flavor to it. Uh, or you could just cut the, cut the white part in julienne's, cook them in the leek oil, again, very, very lightly. Make some aromats, maybe lemon peels, sea salt, and have it on your toast with perhaps broad beans or avocado. It just adds that fatty and pungency. This is a quite interesting one. What fantastic suggestions. Amazing. I, I want to totally make that leek, leek oil. Yeah, oh, that, that sounds very amazing, simple. Grisham. I, I, so, I, I, I'm all over that next time. Yeah. I've yeah. Got some it's equal quantities of leek and oil, like 100 grams of leek, 100 okay. ml of oil, blend it together, bring it to boil once and just pass it. That's it. It will mm. be like bright green. Amazing. What Gorgeous. a great idea. Yeah. Lauren, I do you ferment leeks? Well, <laughs> probably could do. Um, I love those ideas. I mean, you're all making me want to cook leeks. But <laughs> the thing that is maybe a bit different that I really love to do is actually have them raw. So slicing them really, really finely, normally the green bit. But there's um, a really nice dish, actually, that... Sarah, who um, she's so delicious, teaches on one of our courses, but it's like um, a kind of Asian style tofu with really finely sliced leeks on top and literally just marinated a little bit in um, like some sesame oil and tamari. And that's delicious. And what I've started doing is, especially now it's more, well, not so much this week, but coming, you know, into spring, summer, is just literally um, tossing them in a little bit of olive oil and salt and having them in salads or as like a fresh kind of tangy element to things. But yeah, I really like doing them like that. That's nice. really interesting. And I kind of want to take us straight on to Sharon's question. She says, um, uh, you find that samphir is traditionally paired with fish. Um, what plant-based dishes would be tasty with samphir and I just, well, see, I heard that oh, I've got to shut my mouth and, and let you guys talk first. But um, let's uh, ask you, Rishim. Oh, uh, Samfer. Yeah, I mean, traditionally, it's usually uh, paired with fish a lot. You know, I remember making like a piece of fish and some Samfer on top and some butter. And that's pretty much it. Because it's got that salty sea sort of flavor, right? Uh, cooking with Samfer, it's quite easy, actually. So it's fairly, uh, there's so much you can do again with that. What... I, I remember we did a dish with artichokes. So we took the chivis from artichokes, we confit them, scooped them out, and we had that skin. So we deep fried the skin and have the, the pulp separate. So this was our take on the dressed crab dish. Um, so we have this crispy skin and we have this soft, juicy artichoke pulp. And then uh, we used to mix that with some rapeseed oil, some chopped sample and uh, some sea salt, some lemon, and just mm. kind of scoop it back in. It's like a chill version of your uh, stuffed potatoes, uh, potato skins, what do you call it? It's quite refreshing. It's really good for, it's, it's in season now, so it works really well. Mm. And pickling obviously works amazingly well because it's such a strong flavor, right? I mean, you, you would get, let's say, 100 grams. And in each dish, you'll probably just use like 5 to 10 grams because it's super salty and you just want to balance it out properly. 
Um, so in situations like those, I would recommend probably just pickling them uh, in your basic vinegar, coriander seeds, fennel, water, lemon, and just put them in a jar. And they lose color, but they still have that saltiness with that sea sort of flavor. So that works amazingly well. That's brilliant. Can I ask one of those non-chef questions, which is, did you say you confit the uh, Jerusalem artichokes? Yeah, you confit them. So, yeah. How do you, uh, you confit? <laughs> Um, Sorry so, to ask. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's it's yeah. So we basically cook the adi chokes in fat on very low heat for about forty five minutes or so. Um, when I say low heat, that's touching about eighty eighty five degrees. Um, so they're still a bit soft and they take the flavor of the fat very well. Yeah. And if I, kind of drain if, I so. if I put my swimming trunks on, can I kind of slide in there with them? Because it sounds delightful <laughs> to me. <laughs> It's 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 like a junior version of deep frying, isn't it? Like you know, it's a yeah, safer yeah. version of deep frying. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, thanks for for helping out someone who has no training. Um, Lauren, what about you? What would you do with Sanfia? Well, I mean, I think it's obviously it does have that taste of the sea, so it's really great if you ever make things like carrot locks. So I love to do if you make a kind of smoked carrot salmon as such yes um but you can serve that on bellinis with a little bit of samphire it's really nice sometimes like tiny tip of raw samphire is great um but you can also obviously kind of like cook it down i love to make yeah carrot locks kind of on bagels or pancakes as a really nice kind of brunchy dish and i would sometimes like fold a little bit of samphire through a salad or some greens as well which is really nice to do and how do you how do you do your carrot locks Ah, so again, confit is the word of the moment. But, nice. uh, but yeah. I will get my bathing suit. Yeah, this is your <laughs> bathing suit moment. But um, but yeah, so whole carrots um, under oil and with like seaweed and smoked paprika, smoked salt. And then once they're, you know, really soft and buttery, then cooling them, cutting them very, very thinly and then smoking them with a smoking gun. Amazing. Wow. Delish. Smoking gun. Uh, Jackie. What do, you, what do you like to do with Sam Fear? Yeah, well, actually, this there's a dish I've had at a restaurant in London um, that I thought was amazing. Um, I, as you know, I'm into Asian street food and uh, it was at a Sri Lankan restaurant and they make a sambal with the samphire. And nice. it, it kind of was made with um, curry leaves and chili flakes and salt and shallots. And that's kind of smooshed up with, uh, I imagine, a pestle and mortar. They've done that, and then that's all sort of tossed with the with the samphire and some rehydrated. Co- well, they did it with fresh coconut, but you could use rehydrated coconut, re- desiccated coconut. Um, much more accessible to us, I think, than um, fresh coconut. We don't all walk around with a hammer. <laughs> exactly. You I can mean, do I yourself do. a serious injury with a coconut. Believe me, I've <laughs> nearly done that before now. <laughs> yeah. You know, you go to hit it with a big uh, cleaver and the thing bounces back back up at you. It's um yeah, yeah. no, you've got to be careful My with a fresh car. coconut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah, with um with some chili and some coconut and lime and and uh grated with some grated carrot and then with a small amount of samphire mixed in because the salt with the spices, the salty flavour with all the spices, I just thought it worked brilliantly. But I actually, um, I tried it in some spaghetti last year uh, with some pasta and I just made a kind of lemony creamy sauce using um, the good old Oatly, uh, Oatly sort of their creme fraiche. I know they don't call it that, do they? But they make something. I, yeah, I know what you're talking really, about. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And just that with some garlic and some lemon, make a nice creamy sauce. And you, and as Rashim was saying, you do not need too much. It's got quite a strong flavour. So in that mm. spaghetti, I probably put maybe only 10 to 15 grams of samphire into the spaghetti. But it was delicious because the lemony just balanced out with that sort of sea, sea-like flavour. So that worked really well. Nice. I was going to say, um, not that anyone asked me, but um, <laughs> th- what I do with Samphir is, uh, and this is like level five vegan. Like this is, you know, you, you have to have gone through all the stages. Like level one, chips and hummus. <laughs> level two, fake sausages. <laughs> level three, soy milk tastes okay. Level four, you're ready for vegan cheese. This is level five, right? So, you know, it comes with a warning. But um, 
I uh, I steamed it and I just had it. I, I had it as a bed and on top I just put a block of cold tofu, just plain tofu and a little bit of like sesame oil and some sesame yeah. seeds. And that was kind of it. And it's sort of unusually pure for me, although nice. it's massively high in sodium. So there is that. But um, <laughs> that was delicious. But I was thinking about your um, shredded raw leeks. Um, Lauren and I was thinking actually that would be really good just on kind of plain tofu if you're mm. at level five which I appreciate not everyone is you know some people aren't ready to embrace tofu like that it's not good. I'm not I'm sure a big block of raw tofu I feel like we're not going to I mean win I sliced it I didn't, I didn't just like okay. it was just like a fat <laughs> lump it <laughs> a plate bucket. lump yeah no it was, it was I sliced it you know I feel I was, like we're not going to win people summit. over to plant-based food <laughs> yeah. when you know describing like yeah. this lump of tofu yeah. people are going to be like oh yeah. my god and Lord. I ate it next to a biffa bin yeah you're welcome <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, let's move on. Tracy says, how can I achieve the crispy fried rice at home? Oh. I often try and it just sticks to the pan or overcooks the rice. I like the rice to have texture and be almost crunchy. Uh, Rishim, let's start with you. Uh, oh, mm. I, I, yeah, I think I'm going to go a bit more technical on this. Uh, crispy rice. There, there are a few ways of doing it, right? Either you cook your rice at a low heat and you're going to scrape the bottom and then have this crispy leg upside down, palau, uh, very mad. Or you could have leftover rice and you could just season them a little bit, press them down, make them in little blocks and slice them up. Um, oh. What I like in like little cubes, sort of in like big, big, big chunks sort of thing. Um, then I would get a pan fairly hot non-stick pan again don't cough near it uh get it to a smoking <laughs> point hot <laughs> and uh, put the rice in like just just treat it like a piece of polenta you would fry a piece of polenta or a piece right. of squash and just turn it over so that it's nice and crunchy on both sides um put that in now at this stage it's it's pretty either you want to slice it put it in a salad or Maybe have your leftover curry, just put that curry on top or, or uh, create crazy ideas with that. So yeah, there's, there's quite an easy rice, crispy rice cake sort of texture. That's a, you, you, yeah, a rice crispy uh, cake. Lovely. Yeah. Um, Jackie. I, I, I'm, I'm just drooling over that crispy yeah. rice cake. <laughs> and I think, you know, in Indonesia, they have a sort of non-crispy version of that cake called long tong, which I would put some gado gado style peanut sauce on. So I'm thinking we should crispy crispy rice cake mm-hmm. with some gado gado style sauce and some raw veggies would be delish. Also, of course, you've got the Persian tardig, which is is an awesome crispy rice dish. Um as Richard was just describing, it's where you cook it very, very slowly um, so the bottom crisps up. But what you actually do is you cook the rice first and then you take a portion of the rice and you mix it with some vegan yogurt. And then you you put that in and, and some saffron, uh, saffron water, and you pop that into the bottom of your non-stick pan that you have not breathed on. <laughs> And I actually use the inside of my rice cooker to do it. It's the easiest pan to use. And then and then you you layer the rice inside and pour the rest of the saffron water on, cover it, cook it super, super slowly for like 30, 40, even 50 minutes. It's really slow heat. And you get this incredible golden crust around the outside of this rice. It's absolutely fantastic. It's probably my favorite crispy rice dish, actually, Tardig. Nice. Lauren. These are all so delicious that I'm like, what can I add? They, um, yeah, I'm also sort of drawling over them. Um, The thing that sprung to mind, which is, again, a a little bit of a different one, but something that you can do with leftover rice, but is actually dry it out. So like in an oven dehydrator, so it's super crispy, and then um, fry it, deep fry it, so it pops. And that's delicious so you can again cook it in stocks or seasoning so it's got like a bit of flavor already and then there's a chef that teaches on one of our courses and he does something called like vegetable cereal where he'll serve all sorts of different veggies with this deep fried rice Mm. and it's the crispiest thing ever but it's really good for that you know if you really want it crispy then that's a great way all of this is all hazmat suit stuff Um, (laughs) 
Those are great suggestions, and I, I do love, I do love, I do love crispy rice, and I, I, I sort of roast rice sometimes. I'll sort of just work some oil through it with my fingers and then stick it in a baking tray. But I would suggest, Tracy, um, as well as those amazing answers, uh, have a listen to the World Food Tour Spain episode uh, that we did over the summer, where I think I think there were more thoughts on how to get that kind of crust on your rice. <laughs> We'll be back with the panel in a second. But first, Pho, the Vietnamese restaurant group with locations all over the UK, really do have something Pho everyone, uh, including Pho Pho. I'm kidding. They wouldn't do that. Their main menu is 40% vegan and ranges from delicious, healthy noodle soups to decadent Vietnamese curries. With restaurants as far south as Exeter and as far north as Edinburgh, visit www.phocafe, that's P-H-O, cafe, .co.uk to find your nearest foe and book a table. Or don't even leave the house. Find them on Deliveroo. Let's get back to the panel. The social poster, I think, or the social post essay, I'm not sure, says, OK, OK, mushroom questions. Wait a minute, we did that episode. That was like... When did you wake up? Hmm. <laughs> it says, or is it too late? Well, Kai, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, here we are. We're talking about rice in the best of British episode. I don't know. Uh, the feeling on fresh versus powdered when it comes to not being able to grow them yourself or source fancy mushrooms like shiitake and reishi uh, and whether powdered mushrooms lose some of their nutrients when cooked on a high heat for a longer time. I mean, we're just throwing you in with a very random, quite quite technical mushroom question there uh i'm gonna throw this one wide open to all three of you and anybody who wants to jump in go for it mushrooms is definitely like hot topic and something that i love talking about but um so with something i've kind of learned over time with a friend of mine that has a mushroom company is that one if you're using mushroom powders you need to make sure they're double extracted and they actually do like heat so that you can cook them like unlike things like cbd or other you know little tonics and powders you've got to be really heat careful with heat but things like um reishi and shiitake you can cook with obviously you have to be very mindful of the taste like reishi is very bitter as we'll know um, i have no idea what reishi is i mean are we, are we broken any kind of international laws here with this <laughs> definitely okay, not fine. okay i have so, no idea so carry on so reishi is um one of the more medicinal mushrooms so it's really good for like deep cellular healing and relaxation hormones like all the all the magic things um but yeah so they're great in food and they're really useful in stocks and things so you can make more medicinal stocks with mushroom powders and i would say that um if you are wanting to use those kind of mushrooms then either go with the powder but make sure it's double extracted and not raw so if it says raw you don't want it it hasn't been treated properly um, but also to use tinctures, like so say if I'm doing drinks or salad dressings or anywhere that I, or like a raw dessert, for example, I would use a mushroom tincture and a really good one is the Bristol Fungarium and they grow all their own mushrooms in the UK. So wow. they're the best of the best and they're really, really high quality tinctures, especially. Wow. That was a, yeah. an amazingly technical answer. Well done. Wow. Jackie. <laughs> I know. I feel uh, that's that's quite a tough one to follow there. Although I, I am in, I am into the superfood varieties of mushrooms. Um, so you know the lion's mane as well, and the chaga and the the shiitake. Um, and I think what we have to bear in mind is that if when mushrooms are dried, they're dried at a very low temperature. Um, so generally, that preserves a lot more of the nutrients. Actually, fresh mushrooms when they're cooked. In, in a higher heat in a pan, they lose half their nutrients at that point, usually. Um, a mushroom loses half its protein, apparently, when you when you cook it. So wow. um, I think, you know, most vegetables do lose some nutrients when they're processed or when they're cooked. And I think that's one of the arguments for why we need to eat more raw food in our diets. So, um, you know, I, although obviously this person... It sounds like they can maybe only get hold of powdered mushrooms. But in Italy, dry puccini is just a big staple because puccini and a lot of the wild forage mushrooms, they have such a short season that they have to be dried. Otherwise, we wouldn't have access to them in the rest of the year. And um, as I say, you know, if you get it from a good quality source, they're dried at a very, very low temperature. And I do powder those myself and use them 
as to enhance stocks because the the umami from the dried mushroom is far more powerful than the fresh mushroom. So I think it's great for vegans because it just brings so much flavor to the party. Um, so I don't think, and I think, you know, as long as you're getting a balanced diet, I don't think, you know, unlike somebody who maybe is only having two meals a day and eating the same food every day, maybe yeah, sure. they no, maybe no, no, no. have to be concerned. Sure. <laughs> But if you're getting that balanced diet and you're eating some raw foods too in that diet, then I don't think you need to worry that, you know, using dried or powdered foods are are, are losing too many nutrients. Yeah. Okay. Rishim. Yeah. (laughs) Mushroom. So Jack and Lauren has covered most of the nutrients and, you know, how how to work with it. It's, uh, yeah. With me, I I, I kind of, I love mushrooms for the umami. I think just, just that. Mm. That that thing that comes with it, you know, there's so much you can do with it. So the dried mushrooms, uh, you you can use them for broth. You know, you can use them like in a soup. You can just add sprinkle some dried mushroom powder on top, uh, or you can turn them into like a mushroom salt. Blend some salt with mushrooms, make a nice risotto. Again, just sprinkle on top. So you know, as that adds that umami sort of touch to it. Uh, or if you can soak them just using a stir fry that again works works really well it gets that nice chewy sort of meaty texture whereas growing mushrooms I do have a very interesting story uh, <laughs> I think it was about four or five years ago I was just trying to learn how to grow mushrooms at home I bought this beautiful kit with that rice hay and spores and you had to you know uh, pierce the bag and hang it at an elevation put in a cupboard somewhere. So I did that. So at that time we were living in a smaller flat and uh, I emptied out one of my cupboards and I hung the mushroom with the back there with spores and everything. First few days, zero activity. I was like, Jesus, I've killed it already. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing's happening. And I think we were away for a weekend or something and we came back on Sunday evening. We opened the cupboard and it was the whole cupboard had turned white. <laughs> so all the wow. Mushrooms, there was mushrooms coming out of everywhere. We were like this planet of mushrooms right now. My wife's like, <laughs> either that goes or I go. <laughs> oh, wait, uh, Amazing. I, like the whole house was smelling of mold for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah I, you I, do have to think about the resale. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, we, we did do we did do an episode all about mushrooms that um, you might want to check yeah. out if you if you want to learn more about that. And I think they said timing is everything with the mushrooms. Well, they they will they will Just take over. Oh my yeah. God, yeah. And interesting, you talk about over. nutrition. Um, I went I went to a, a vegan cafe recently, and uh, the guy there, um, he's I was picking out a cake. And he said, "Try this one," and it was like a sort of a an almost raw uh, chocolate cake with a white chocolate ganache, and on the top, just a little sliver of a mushroom and he explained that nice. it has, you know sort of healing properties and stuff and I was like well this is unconventional but you know this guy had done a great sales pitch and I thought do you know what I will try it and it was disgusting <laughs> one of the worst things I've ever tasted but anyway um, have fun do some playing and Nancy says my question is can I have some lunchbox ideas that I can cook for my two children I'd love to give them hearty meals for lunch and to wean myself and them off of the corn and cheese sandwiches even if it is Another sandwich, something a bit more elevated. Thank you. Yeah, again, Nancy, we did, I think we did a, a kids a kids uh, special uh, podcast where we did talk about packed lunches. But um, what suggestions do you have, uh, Lauren? Let's start with you. Um, well, so I think I mean when I read this earlier, I wasn't actually thinking lunchbox. I was thinking sort of kids and making food. Yeah. Um, but um, a really good thing is to make pancakes. And so like not necessarily, they could be used in lunch boxes, but to just think of like different toppings, especially savory pancakes. So making things like hummus is great for lunch boxes, obviously. And I think if, whether it's kind of more like meals for lunch, um, but yeah, to make pancakes, top them with different like seasonal vegetables, you can put great different veggies and put them in the batter. And yeah, they're just quite fun to make and you can include loads and loads of different things. So um, yeah, that was one idea that I thought of. That's a great idea. <laughs> That's a lovely idea. Thank you. Um, Rishim, what about you? 
uh, two meals a day, beans and bananas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them happy. You heard the episode. Go on. Uh, wow. I mean, the, the, the most difficult ones to feed on there. Like, you know, they, they want something new and still want something easy every day. Um, I think something sweet, but without adding sugar should work. Um, like a sweet potato wedge with some tofu or some scrambled vegan cheese. Um, because lunchbox, I'm guessing it's probably going to get soggy by the time you actually eat it. So you want something with less fat so that it doesn't kind of stick to your mouth. Um, or even a sandwich with some, like a med inspired sandwich, some grilled vegetables, any lettuce from last night, perhaps rice cakes, crispy rice cakes. Um, and if you want to add some sort of health angle, maybe a kale, pesto with some nuts, a uh, bit of fresh, bit of good quality olive oil, or a falafel wrap, a hummus falafel. I mean, buy the falafel mm. from the store, uh, make a really quick hummus with a chickpea tin, a uh, dollop of tahini and bunch of other stuff and that kind of adds to things, yeah. Nice. And Jackie? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought about along, as Arushan was saying, the, the, mez, the mezzy kind of, you know, you could have a little lunchbox with its little compartments and have a couple of falafel and some hummus and some baba ganoush and maybe put some ch- tortilla chips in there and, you know, pita, pita, bits of pizza, that would be quite exciting for them. But uh, I actually worked I with, um, uh, I helped, a somebody write a cookbook a couple of years ago and um we we came up with a, a lunch box for children it was a noodle cookbook and um so the recipe was you cook up some noodles just some wheat noodles or rice noodles whatever whichever you prefer and you drain and cool them and you pop them into the lunch box along with some some uh, shredded lettuce and like sliced peppers, grated carrots and some bits of roasted aubergine. And then you make a little sauce pot. And for the children version, we had like half a tablespoon of soy, half a tablespoon of dark soy, some ketchup, little maple syrup, mix it all together. And then you pour it all over the noodles and sprinkle with some sesame seeds. So it's like a cold noodle salad. But if the child was a little bit older, what you could actually do is keep the sauce separate and they could have a little flask of hot water. And then when they get to school or college, they can mix the the little sauce with the hot water and pour it over their noodles. And they've got like a little noodle soup. I'm obsessed with noodle soup. I'm sorry. That's a fantastic I would have, idea. I would have noodle soup for lunch. Actually, breakfast, I do have it for breakfast, lunch and dinner most days when I'm in Southeast Asia. I I, I just love it. And, oh, yeah. and we came up with this idea for these lunch boxes um, to, and I think if you were going to do an adult version, maybe add some mirin on some rice vinegar and some chili to your little sauce mix, give it a little bit of spice. And so it's something you could have hot or cold and then they're getting loads of veggies too. Fantastic. These are, these are yeah, go on. I was just going to chip in that it just made me think that there's um, a really good book or two really good books about literally lunch boxes and all of those things. But um, Sarah, again, so my friend and business partner, but she's got one called Bento Power. So it's all kind of like um, Japanese inspired bentos, but really great, easy ideas to use. And then also Black and Bloom, who make those beautiful kind of lunch boxes. They just brought a book out and it's filled with like really easy ideas as well. So yeah. Brilliant. I, I would say for me the most transformative thing, and I think I think it came out of the the episode we did about kids. Um, someone said get them a flask, and you can get these little food flasks um, mm. with a nice wide neck. And th- he just I just give him leftovers. You know, I yeah. always overcook the, the, when I cook an evening meal, um, and then I'll just he'll just have whatever he had last night, and he's perfectly happy with it. Okay, I'll chop up baked potato and you know hot it up with. Um, cheese and marge or sausages or you know like just whatever they eat mm. i'll just mm. stick it and he's he's always happy but the the little the little pot on the side of ketchup does often go down extremely well um <laughs> and always heat your flask first with some boiling water before you put the food in that's my top 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 tip anyway thank you for those crikey we need to crack on maya says aubergine is my favorite food by a country mile thank you thank you thank you yes maya Big finally of for thank maya. you <laughs> <laughs> I would say I'm mildly obsessed with it <laughs> and eat it four to five times a week. Uh, That's a lot. W- yeah. 
Um, it's a lot of aubergines. Uh, what are the guests' favourite aubergine dishes? Awesome. Open question. Love it. Uh, Lauren, let's start with you. So, aubergine. Um, one of the, I was actually um, making loads of things with aubergine today, randomly. But um, So, something I love to do is uh, like vegetable tambe. So, it's like a Mjorkian dish. So, like layers of like potato and um, aubergine courgettes. So, it's you literally just slice everything and put it in the oven, oil and salt. Great. Make a really nice kind of tomato sauce. So, something with like maybe some rosemary and thyme is really good and a little bit of smoked chilli. Um, and then... Today, I was doing that with a hemp pesto in the middle. So, like, layering it all up and adding pesto. So, using the aubergine, like, as a little stack. Um, but I also love to make it into kind of like an aubergine bacon or aubergine crisps. So, just, you know, slicing it really thinly. Again, marinating it in the kind of marinade you do any sort of those kind of, like, veg bacon style things. So, tamari, smoked paprika, sometimes a bit of sesame oil, smoked salt. Um, and then dehydrate it or bake it and you get really yummy crisps. You can dip in like a, if you're really into aubergine and a vaba ganoush or some hummus or similar. So Nice. Double yeah. aubergine. Double aubergine. I, they said it couldn't be done. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, Rishim, what about you? What do you like to do with an aubergine? Um, I think last time I was on the show, we had this aubergine discussion. Of course. We did. And uh, I remember Andrew mentioned that Aubergine actually contains nicotine, so you probably have to no. eat like no. <laughs> two kilos of ten kilos of aubergine to get one hit of cigarette. That's so right. We said maybe... it's hard to keep it in the cigarette paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah so maybe some some inspiration to that. Um, I I do like smoked aubergine. Nothing to do with the nicotine, but just actually smoked <laughs> aubergine. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 very usual back home also. You kind of pierce the aubergine, put on live fire, like on a, a range or burn the top, and cook it, like burn the skin and scoop it out, and then you just add your spices or whatever you want. It's uh, it's very big. I mean, in any country, go aubergine has always got recipes. Uh, but if you do like to eat aubergine four to five times a week, and I would say just kind of chop it up, salt it. Pickle it, add some spices, leave it in a jar, just cook something else and put that aubergine on top so that you still get your four to five times four to five times a week, but you get to try other things also. So this is raw aubergine that you salt and then you pick it. Raw aubergine, salt it, just okay. kind of squeeze all the oil, uh, all the water out, put yeah. in a jar, more spices, just touch off oil and put it away in a cupboard. It just nice. becomes it starts to pickle a little bit, starts to ferment a little bit. Oh, I want to try quite, that. It's quite interesting on toast and all of that. Yeah. Jackie, do you do you love an aubergine? I do love an aubergine. And obviously in Italy, they love aubergines here. <laughs> um, so I, I would also um, be, I very much enjoy pickling um, aubergines. I like a nice Indian style pickled aubergine, uh, which is, not that difficult to make, actually, and a lot cheaper than buying a famous brand in the jar. So uh, there's a recipe in vegan street food to make that pickled aubergine. Nice. Um, and, an, and another dish that I really love to, a very simple one, of course, is the Japanese style miso aubergine. So you just halve it and put slashes across, crisscross slashes, cover it in some miso, bake it. Well, actually, no, start baking it first with a little olive oil till it starts to soften. Slap some miso on there, back into the oven. That's delicious with some just some si simple sticky rice. Um, and I love Persian style aubergines where you cut some big slabs, make it quite thick slabs. I don't know why I'm waving my hands around because I don't know if people are going to see me doing excited. this. It has got me excited, hasn't it? Happens. It? it happens. And, um, and just uh, bake those thick slices until they're nice and golden brown and soft. And then I make... Um, a sort of Persian style lentils using um, pre lentils with a mirepoix. Um, and you put the lentils in with some sumac and cumin and pomegranate molasses. And then, and then to set it all up, you just lay the aubergines over the cooked lentils, drizzle with some tahini sauce, scatter some parsley and pomegranate seeds on it. It's absolutely delicious. Um, that's one of my favorite. Dishes to eat aubergine, I think. And baba ganoush, which I could also get my swimming shorts out for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd all do that. Um, yeah, watch the commercial ones, though. Some of them have got milk in. Um, 
I'm going to conflate uh, the last two questions because uh, time is ticking away. Uh, Pip says, what's the best way to cook cauliflower? Also, how to make cauliflower rice? Do I have to flavour it or cook it or do I eat it raw? <laughs> and Regini says, Jake, I'm loving the podcast. So brilliant. And I've binged all the episodes in three weeks. That's not healthy. That's not good for you. Where are you? Are you OK? <laughs> are you OK? Do we need to come again? Um, and I'm thrilled to do a British cuisine episode. I'd like to know what the panel's favourite way to cook potatoes is. Uh, it's such a versatile vegetable. I mean, amen. Uh, and how have the guests perfected their favourite potato method? So really what we're saying is, what do you like to do with cauliflower and what do you like to do with potatoes? It, and, and not necessarily at the same time, because you'll all say alu co- gobi. But um, <laughs> Jackie, let's start with you. Okay, cauliflower, I would say I make a Thai soup, like a Tom Car which is a coconut based soup, very fragrant. Cauliflower works brilliantly in it. For making the rice, I grate it raw and then just blanch it very quickly, one minute in boiling water. And then you can flavor it afterwards, toasted cumin, turmeric, whatever you fancy. And potatoes, as an Irish woman, I have to say Colconnen. Um, You know, make a really good mash, fry up some of your favorite cabbage, especially like kale or savoy cabbage. And um, in my family, we chop up some spring onions and we put we chop up a bit of veggie bacon, vegan bacon, and we mix it all together. And that is comfort food central coming straight from Ireland. <laughs> Sounds great. I like that you had to sort of do the caveat because I, I guess there are as many recipes for Colcannon as there are families in Ireland. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's one of those ones. I didn't want to upset anybody. No, no exactly. You didn't. I, uh, Rishim, what about you? Oh. Uh. I'm still quite confused, actually. Why do we call it cauliflower rice? It's more like a cauliflower couscous, isn't it? I guess. Yes, it's it is. It's not really a rice yeah. texture. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, cauliflower couscous slash rice. I like to say cauliflower quinoa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Grated cauliflower. Uh, <laughs> I would, uh, just salt, seasoning. Uh, I mean, I, I I like it raw because I like to eat raw cauliflower. I think the flavor isn't pretty good because it's in such a small form, so you don't really have to do much. Um, so yeah, just as a salad topping, or uh, I think sesame will work really well, or curry oil, I think works really well with cauliflower rice in that sense. Um, whereas potatoes, there's so, so much you can do. I don't know, again, whatever culture you pick, there's thousand different recipes for a potato. Uh, what we do, we kind of make like a potato terrine sort of. So we slice the potatoes really thinly, uh, layer them up in a tray, just add salt and kind of dust with flour every four or five layers, bake it, and then they once it like nice and soft, and they will have those burnt brown edges. Um, then you press it with another tray on top in some way. Don't stand on it, just use some oil paints or whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> Put it in the fridge and then yeah, bring it out, slice it, deep fry, pan fry. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's like fancy version of chips. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's quite nice. You you yeah. had me at frying. Great. <laughs> and Lauren, what would you do with cauliflower and potato? So, um, cauliflower rice. My top tip would be yeah, do it raw. But depending on the cauliflower, actually, food processor, but not too much. Just pulse it and then actually put it through in a piece of muslin or cloth to get any moisture, which helps it to be fluffier. And when you process it, if you add some sesame seeds or coconut chips or anything to kind of bulk it out, it's a really good like raw salad that then you could have with, I mean, all it's great in um, in nori rolls. I love cauliflower rice in nori rolls filled with maybe like raw marinated mushrooms and massaged kale and avocado and like all the good things. So yeah, nice. that would be my kind of cauliflower rice tip. Um, for potatoes, um, one, of course, the classic roast, roast potato, but since going to Peru, where they always serve like um, roast sort of crispy potatoes with guacamole, I tend to like parboil potatoes, really rough them up, add kind of smoked paprika, lots of chopped rosemary, salt, and then bake them in hot oil that's been heated in the oven until they're really, really crispy. And that that's with a hazmat suit. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And um, and then the other way that I'm, the thing I'm kind of living off at the moment is potato dauphinois. So just making like a vegan dauphinois. And there's a recipe in my book that's sweet potato dauphinois with chili. And um, it's a mix of like normal, like, well, any sort of white potato and 
sweet potatoes, cut really finely, put down a bit of veg stock, add a cashew cream, so just cashews water blended, and then season that up with some nutritional yeast and chilli and different spices and then pour it in a tin, bake it in the oven, and then you can make a big portion and just eat it through the week. And it's like a very key comfort food. Anything that you can just go into the fridge with a spoon. Uh, I think it's perfect that we've ended our Best of British episode with potato dauphinois. Um, it feels right, you know, because uh, if, if nothing else, we are a melting pot uh, in this country. Stuffed with aubergines, apparently. Um, thank you all so, so much. It's been a really great uh, episode. And uh, you. before you go, where can we find you and your work? Lauren. So you can find me on Instagram. So Lauren underscore love it. I've recently got my book, as you mentioned at the beginning, Mind Food, which is available everywhere. But we're also selling it on my cookery school website, Plant Academy London. So, yeah, you'll find me there. Perfect. Jackie? Uh, yeah, you can find me on social media, um, on Instagram. I, I'm the Hungry Gecko. I should probably change it to my actual name, actually. It might be easier for people to find me. Or become a gecko. Or become a gecko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And I also have the website, thehungrygecko.com. So you can find links to all of my books on through my website or through my Instagram um, account. I do have a Twitter account, but I've sort of stopped going on there because it's just It's just a great place to chill out and make friends. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Um, um, I mean, yes, it's an interesting, the Hungry Gecko. I've just Googled and uh, what they they mainly eat is flies, mosquitoes, beetles, (laughs) (laughs) pickles. So it, no, yeah. I, no, it came around because it came around because they're so common in Asia, and my food passion was Asian street food, sure. and I was the first um, contestant in MasterChef to ever um, who was vegetarian who made it to the final. You know, no vegan or vegetarian right. has ever ever got past those first rounds. Yeah. You know, and the only reason that I probably didn't go all the way is because of that because I think they were a little bit like we really can't have someone making vegan food in the final because <laughs> um, yeah. this was 2011 oh, so yeah, yeah. Those, you know those were dark days the dark days you see you know Greg could not take it he was like what yeah. I, what, yeah. it, what 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 you eat what do you eat <laughs> what, 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 yeah I can hear what? it now. and then he said I know I hate coriander and I thought well that's me done isn't it making yeah. Asian street food oh, so okay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you're yeah um, you're in glad company <laughs> um and rishim what about you uh virtually you can find me on instagram at chef rishim sasteva uh or tendril kitchen and physically i'm usually in a basement doing some podcast watching videos <laughs> but we just have this beautiful pub which we rented on a rolling mud basis. It's just off Old Street Roundabout. It's called the Atlery Arms. Amazing. And yeah, we, we, we're here for a bit. And yeah, we're just, you know, cooking a few days a week and we're setting up for hopefully to a new permanent space soon. So yeah. And there we must leave it uh, for another week. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the show. Don't forget, you can email us your questions about any kind of vegan food. It's podcast at veganlifemag.com. At veganlifemag.com, you can find out more about the magazine. You can buy a subscription. You can go to a shop. You can do it. Maybe, maybe you could just do a dance and people would like, be like, here, have this magazine. I was really inspired by that. It's pretty unlikely. Um, don't know why I said it. It's quite late. I should probably go to bed. Um, <laughs> we're on social media. It's veganlife underscore podcast if you'd like to join us there say hi uh and you can you can say hi to me too i'm jake yap it's a real name hard to believe i mean you wouldn't have chosen it would you anyway take care bye-bye this has been a swan burst media production